from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for coming out uh, to the U.S. Naval Observatory Library. My name is Rob Casper. I'm the uh, head of the Poetry Literature and Literature Center at the Library of Congress. And we are very pleased to be partnering with the U.S. Naval Observatory and with the library's FedLink division, which stands for uh, Federal Library and Information Network, uh, to bring you this uh, first ever event, Poetry in the Stars. Uh, a little information about the library and this library. Uh, the, po the, the, the Library of Congress is the nation's largest, world's largest library. This is the largest astronomy library in the United States. Um, Sally Boskin, who is a librarian here, told me that this is uh, one of six rooms uh, that contain uh, the collection for the library and that this is the only pretty room, that all the others are downstairs in the basement. So. Um, this is also, I've heard, the room where the vice president uh, does his um, uh, uh, interviews. So uh, we are in hallowed ground, uh, legislatively speaking and militarily speaking, and certainly in terms of libraries. Um, FedLink, the uh, organization that I talked about that is co-sponsoring this event, is uh, led by Blaine Desi. And this um, event was the brainchild of Blaine Desi and by uh, Sally Boskin. Uh, FedLink connects to libraries, federal libraries, around the world. And uh, we at the Library of Congress hope to promote poetry and literature at events like this and at our newly launched pizza and poetry series at Andrews Air Force Base. We had a pizza and poetry um, event uh, this past spring. There was good poetry and there was plenty of pizza. Uh, this is a different kind of event. Uh, let me just ask you right now to turn off your uh, cell phones or any electronic devices you have so that uh, they don't interfere with our recording equipment or the event. Uh, I, as I said, I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center. Uh, the center has been uh, the home to the consultant in poetry and the uh, Poet Laureate consultant in poetry for the past 75 years. Uh, we also sponsor all sorts of readings, events, lectures, and uh, wonderful, exciting um, conversations such as we'll have uh, in just a few minutes. To find out more about our events and to sign up uh, to um, receive emails about our events, you can go to www.loc.gov poetry. This morning, we are lucky enough to be in this lovely space and have an, a chance to imagine the skies and the stars as poets have for centuries. To lead us, we have poet Elizabeth Arnold, who will read from and respond to poets as wide-ranging as Keats, Robert Creeley, Elizabeth Bishop, and Archilokos, a Greek poet who hopefully I pronounced uh, correctly. She will also weave in her own poems on astronomical themes and speak as someone who creates poetry from the simple act of looking up and the complex reckoning such an act involves. Elizabeth will read, and I will follow with a short moderated discussion. We will also have time afterwards for any questions you may have. Please be aware that this, this event is being recorded by the Library of Congress, and any question you ask will be included in our webcast. That should go up hopefully in, in a few months after this. Uh, Elizabeth Arnold, our guest poet, is the author of three poetry collections, The Reef, Civilization, and Effacement, which came out in 2010 by Flood Editions. She has received an Amy Lowell Traveling Scholarship, a Whiting Writers Award, a Bunting Fellowship from Radcliffe College, and a Fine Arts uh, Work Center Fellowship. She teaches in the MFA program at the University of Maryland and lives in Hyattsville, Maryland. Please welcome Elizabeth Arnold. Well, thanks, Rob, and um, thanks to everyone who came and all the staff who um, put up signs in very creative ways, uh, witty ways sometimes, um, to get from the, air, uh, from the airport, what am I talking about, from the parking lot to here. And um, so, um, this is an amazing room. Uh, I really feel like uh, a telescope could be in here. Um, it has that 
kind of observatory feel to it. Um, so I was thinking about the poems that I'd read. I, um, I started to realize how much I love it that um, the universe sort of comes in in just little instants in poems about other things, um, earthly things. Um, and then it started to dawn on me how the universe is, in, is everything, um, in everything, including Earth, a planet in the universe after all. And that reminded me of how fast and constantly everything's moving and how we emerged within that circumstance, the way delicate seeming, thin skinned sea creatures did um, that live so deep in the ocean under miles and miles of water. Um, why aren't they crushed? Thoughts of the universe haunt us. Thoughts of how small and helpless we are in relation to it. To ignore this is an instinct of survival. But it's the poet's job to remind us who we are and where we are, to exhilarate us by revealing what we fear and to bring it all alive. The first poem I'll read is by Keats, and it's one of his early poems. It was kind of a breakthrough poem for him. And it's called On First Looking Into Chapman's Homer, um, a particular wonderful translation of Homer. And um, the brief appearance of a planet toward the end of the poem just makes the poem for me. Um, it's the thing that I remember uh, after having read it many, many times. Um, and I think it's just, it, it, it's somehow the way it appears uh, resembles what Chapman's reading this new translation of Homer did for Keats, um, how it astonished him. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his domain, yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez, when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. That the planet's swimming, I think, is part of, um, swims into view, uh, so beautiful. Um, it's the thing that, like I say, it's the thing I remember, even though the ending is also very stunning, um, the state of awe that these people are in by discovering the Pacific Ocean that they didn't anticipate seeing. Sometimes just calling attention to the fact that we're on Earth at all is enough. As in a poem of mine called Trees and George Oppen's Forms of Love, I'll read my poem first. Trees. Trees know which way's up, rallying, after the two blizzards just about broke them. Their bent branches so far down, and some did break. There was a snapped trunk, our narrow maple, trying to grow out of the stump now, reddish, soft new leaves, but they're coming out sideways. Still, the branches only bent by the snow heaps now have stems poking up from the X sides of their down curved limbs, that they know gravity, vertigo from the inside, feel the heave and spin of the globe, grow skyward from that as if crying, I guess isn't so surprising. And here's um, George Oppen's poem, The Forms of Love. Parked in the fields all night, so many years ago, we saw a lake beside us when the moon rose. I remember leaving that ancient car together I remember standing in the white grass beside it. We groped our way together downhill in the bright, incredible light, beginning to wonder whether it could be lake or fog we saw, our heads ringing under the stars. We walked to where it could have wet our feet had it been water. In another poem set mostly at night, Elizabeth Bishop's Man Moth, our vulnerability and awe vis-a-vis -vis the universe takes center stage. This half man, half moth, the title came from a misprint in the paper, it was supposed to be mammoth, um, has a childlike sensibility. 
He sees things newly the way kids can, including the moon. He sees it as a hole in the sky, proving the sky quite useless for protection. Here above, cracks in the buildings are filled with battered moonlight. The whole shadow of man is only as big as his hat. It lies at his feet like a circle for a doll to stand on. And he makes an inverted pen, the point magnetized to the moon. He does not see the moon. He observes only her vast properties, feeling the queer light on his hands, neither warm nor cold, of a temperature impossible to record in thermometers. But when the man moth pays his rare, although occasional visits to the surface, the moon looks rather different to him. He emerges from an opening under the edge of one of the sidewalks and nervously begins to scale the faces of the buildings. He thinks the moon is a small hole at the top of the sky, proving the sky quite useless for protection. He trembles, but must investigate as high as he can climb. Up the facades, his shadow dragging like a photographer's cloth behind him, he climbs fearfully, thinking that this time he will manage to push his small head through that round, clean opening and be forced through as from a tube in black scrolls on the light. Man standing below him has no such illusions. But what the man moth fears most, he must do, although he fails, of course, and falls back scared, but quite unhurt. Then he returns to the pale subways of the cement he calls his home. He flits, he flutters, and cannot get aboard the silent trains fast enough to suit him. The doors close swiftly. The man moth always seats himself facing the wrong way, and the train starts at once at its full terrible speed without a shift in gears or a gradation of any sort. He cannot tell the rate at which he travels backwards. Each night he must be carried through artificial tunnels and dream recurrent dreams, just as the ties recur beneath his train. These underlie his rushing brain. He does not dare to look out the window, for the third rail, the unbroken draft of poison, runs there beside him. He regards it as a disease he has inherited the susceptibility to. He has to keep his hands in his pockets, as others wear mufflers. If you catch him, hold up a flashlight to his eye. It's all dark pupil, an entire night itself, whose haired horizon, horizon tightens as he stares back and closes up the eye. Then from the lids, one tear his only possession, like the bee's sting, slips. Slyly, he palms it. And if you're not paying attention, he'll swallow it. However, if you watch, he'll hand it over, cool as from underground springs and pure enough to drink. I think my having read this poem about a million times led to the writing of this untitled fragment. You can see more as a soul, darkness speeding into darkness, Earth's harder, like a spacecraft on re-entry. The body has to burn its way through the sky's lens. The universe is a place of wonder, a place of fear. We fear it because we have no control over it. We're of it, though also on the ground looking up at it, stuck on the ground not knowing where we're going. Robert Creeley has a humorous take on this state of affairs, and I know a man. As I said to my friend, because I'm always talking, John, I said, which was not his name, the darkness surrounds us. What can we do against it? Or else shall we, and why not, buy a goddamn big car? Drive, he said, for Christ's sake, look out where you're going. A similar kind of anxiety is the subject of a pair of my poems. The first one contains a line in which four of the five words begin with vowels, anywhere other than on earth. The sound dramatizing our vulnerability, no consonants, no armor. Our houses, little roofs begin to seem so thin, so frail. The first one is a pair 
is called rare earth. The biophysicists who think there's little chance that life, advanced that is, exists anywhere other than on earth, say what I felt last night before I read their book, in which they state we're right against it, the abyss, a word whose tone had killed it for me until this. Solstice. We laugh to think the Romans lit great fires in December to persuade the sun to come back, to persuade the sun. Fears about the sun's constancy led to this poem about the enormous prehistoric grave mounds north of Dublin, positioned so that the sun's beams entered the inter inner chambers at certain times each year. Nobody knows why. I speculate about that at the end. But it just so happens that the angle of the sun's light has shifted slightly over the millennia, a source of anxiety for the speaker. At Bru Naboin. The tumulus, I thought it was a hill at first. Trees grow out of one in Sum entered into. It was a clear day, bright, the grass bounded by its hedgerows, two green all around and down, the field squares troubled only by the boyne that just about makes an island of this place, snaking through. Sunbeams don't snake, at least not visibly, though 5,000 years have worked at the Earth's orbit. Still, the light goes in, into the mound, through holes one to a side that tunnel towards each other but don't meet, the sun arriving on time every year unless it's cloudy. But to do what? Wake the corpse. Wilfred Owen, a oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. I meant to ask for that. Wilfred Owen, um, a poet who fought and died in World War II, well, World War I, sorry, um, makes a similar demand of the sun in his poem, Futility. Move him into the sun. Gently its touch awoke him once at home, whispering of fields half sown. Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning and this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old son should know. Think how it wakes the seeds, woke once the clays of a cold star. Our limbs, so dear achieve, our sides, still warm. Uh -uh. Hang on. <laughs> Sorry about that. Our sides, full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. Was it for this the clay grew tall? Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break Earth's sleep at all? A little bit of particle and astrophysics came in handy in a group of poems about my fear of inheriting a family tendency toward mental illness. Here are two short poems from that sequence, um, both obsessing about origins. My, my knowledge of astro and, <laughs> and particle physics is pretty, pretty, pretty small. So anyway, I'm feeling a little uh, intimidated by all these, uh, you know, Newtons over there and Galileo. Anyway, I'm a poet. Genealogy. How is drainage from the blood of the blood from tissues different from the water seeping out of swamps above the tree line into streams than rivers? As much force in us as in an atom's binding split, how different from ideas out of a culture into actions, us. Geology two. Two galaxies, magnetic electricities turn, pulling toward each other their flat seeming disks, the energy extending outward, souls on the outside still intact, articulate, live spinning holes until some other force infringes, disks convulsing into inside-out parentheses, decoalescing, all of it happening so far in the past, 
just as our heads are stuffed with the ghosts we're steered by. Everything always moving, Earth moving around the sun, a sun, a star, and a galaxy that is itself moving, the universe expanding, a hurricane offshore in North Florida where I grew up, and bad news about a biopsy led to thoughts about celestial motion, or one thought, as in so many of these poems, it occurs in an instant. This is from um, my book, which is a book link sequence called The Reef. It doesn't have a title. Here I am a third time, lying on the metal bed in, sh in sheets. The surgeon's tools wink blankly back against the green tiled windowless walls. A nurse's hand like ice in mine. I watch the doctor's mouth speak words while all his other parts, the eyes, the shoulders, hands, say he is sorry. He the knower, healer, doer, as he tells me it's come back, recurred, awakened, de-remissed. But I don't freeze. Just when I hear the words, I'm more alert than even in those heady times when nothing hurts. Beginning, middle, end, make one clear frame inside of which I fit. Back home, outdoors, I sit and stare, hearing in the usual background noise the whistling of the front door keyhole tightened to a buzzing moan, which wakes me up, but this time to a storm offshore somewhere a just named hurricane spinning at the water underneath, hurling the sky out from itself in spirals, hundreds of miles beyond the place it started, which has with earth gone past that point, folding at higher and higher speeds the raw material air into its mass until great gusts of wind enrage the oaks, send dead leaves scattering, scuttling up the street while cloud bands give and take away light turning the world into a carnival, no one escapes. Um, a living poet, Jim Powell, dramatizes this kind of motion for a longer period. It's not a very long poem, but um, anyway, in the desert, it consumes the poem. Once in the night we were falling, with the whole earth heavy beneath us, away from the stars that fell toward us, at the same speed into a loneliness, our singularity birth gate to grave, in that ungentle darkness opening, gathered our falling like cupped hands. Even inside the earth, underground, the heavenly bodies influence what is happening. As is shown in the opening lines of a long poem I'm working on about the largest active volcano in Europe, Mount Etna. Um, I lived for seven months recently in, um, in, in Sicily and just became, I could see Etna from my patio. Uh, the asthenosphere, um, which probably you guys know since you're scientists, a lot of you, um, is the partially molten upper level of the Earth's mantle. And Enceladus uh, was, is a titan from Greek mythology. He angered Zeus, who as punishment had him buried alive under Etna. Also, I mentioned flank vents. And in Etna, most of the, or the worst, the most memorable um, eruptions happen um, out of the side of the mountain. Um, and, and the reason they're so terrible is that they're closer to towns. Um, there are a lot of people live and farm on Etna because the, um, the soil is enriched by the, by the, um, by the lava. Okay. Right now I'm calling the poem The Mountain. Lands alive. I don't mean teeming, breathing. Etna swells, as well as changing shape, height, filling in a bay so that the castle's stranded. Magmatic tides rise, fall in the asthenosphere, responding to the sun and moon, the Earth's crust bending slightly. Earthquakes swarm across the globe. It's feared the very slightest, sub, the very highest subterranean tides could actually knock Earth off its axis. Something practically knocked the whole volcano over 8,000 years ago, and a third of it slid off the island it consisted of at that point, fell into the sea, and the Mediterranean overflowed. Beautiful mountain, mountain of the dead, whose lithic clasts and fumaroles, whose pyroclastics flows go under the lava showers and phreatic bursts, engendered by the titan Enceladus, trapped, fighting up at rock, 
no way out in any case from under as the flank vents open only once, choke thereafter. Okay, so I'm gonna close with a couple of poems and they're both political poems um, that, that bring, bring the universe in. Um, the first is another one by George Oppen um, who was responding to the Vietnam War. Um, the poem crescendos by making us aware of our presence in space. It's called Eclogue. The men talking near the room center, they have said more than they intended, pinpointing in the uproar of the living room an assault on the quiet continent. Beyond the window, flesh and rock and hunger, loose in the night sky, hardened into soil, tilting of itself to the sun once more, small vegetative leaves and stems taking place outside, oh small ones, to be born. So the poem, a lot of Oppen poems had this kind of way of just having this immense wonder at the world. Um, and so even a poem about a war seems positive at the end. Th th those small ones seem kind of vulnerable to me. Um, so I worry about them a little bit. Uh, the last poem I read is called Civilization, and it's, it's, I wrote it. Um, and it was inspired by the September 11th attacks, even from the vantage point of Washington, as opposed to New York. Something as extreme as the world coming apart, literally, materially, didn't seem too big a metaphor for how the events that day made me feel about my own safety and about history. Civilization. The British journalist's voice was spent as she said unenthusiastically, the interview now over, thanks, with the eager young insatiable American official turning then to other matters. But the voice, a European's flat, well-schooled in the world's hope pulverizing particle storms gifts of disappointment, stayed. The syllable slight elongation, something on the order of the querless sendings of frail human wonderings out into the void, as if the waning of her voice spoke all of history's ups and downs, a honeycomb's packed maze of cells whose lights shine through their tiny paper membranes, too thin not to be, available to being torn, light leaking from a world cracked open, sky seen through the pavement I walk down. Okay, thank you. I just realized I didn't read Archilochus. Uh, that's okay. I took Archilochus okay. okay. out. Yeah. There was once a Greek poet who spoke about uh, the stars uh, yeah. in Elizabeth's talk. Uh, thank you very, very much for a okay. terrific talk. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask you is that I realized you began by talking about um, the stars and poetry and speed, and yet uh, I'm struck when thinking about uh, the poems you read and about sort of our relationship to the heavens. Mm -hmm. um, about slowness, about uh, time beyond time, mm -hmm. um, that may speak to how poems may be better equipped to address the celestial than uh, stories or mm -hmm. fiction. And maybe mm -hmm. I thought you could talk about that. Well, well, I think lyric poetry slows time time down. It has these little moments where I always feel like things, you know, time is big. If it's possible to stretch it out and slow it down, and you're inside kind of a moment. Um, and I think if, if a poet can do that, you're sort of pulled into something just astounding, even though it's you know it's right here. Um, and so. I think thinking about what's happening, the fact that we're in this universe and things are moving so fast, and um, I, I, I just, uh, I don't know, I feel, I feel like to slow things down is crucial um, to, in order to have insight, yeah. um, human insight. Um, it was a strange thing to, to prepare this, because I didn't quite know, I started looking at poems, and it's like, the poems that I thought of, you know, had these little tiny moments um, in them, they weren't really about the, the stars, right, you know, maybe right. Jim Powell's is an exception, though loneliness comes in, you know, I mean, it's, it's we're human, you know, it's, we're so human. Um, yeah. um, and, 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 and the outside, the, 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 you know, beyond, it just seems arid, uh, you know? Uh, it seems like something, even though it's beautiful, but it's, 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 it's as um, sort of 
away from us as, as you know, nature seemed to people in the 19th century. You know, th things like this idea of it being other. Mm -hmm. Well, God, it, I mean, it's just so peculiar uh, and so, so distant and, um, it, it, um, you know, uh, inhospitable in a way right. to us. So. Do you think that, that the poems you turned to um, that sort of touched upon uh, the, the skyward, the heavenly, yeah. um, acknowledged our ability to only do that momentarily because to really contend with the right. world beyond the world we're it's overwhelming. in is overwhelming. Yeah, it's overwhelming. Yeah. yeah, I think that's part of it. And I think that there's a sense that, it, I mean, one thing that kind of dawned on me as I was working on this is that, um, that we're haunted by it and that, the, the, mm -hmm. that poets kind of, they're just touching on it, but that's all they have to do, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, to, you know, kind of hit us with it. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, maybe, maybe, maybe just to write about it alone would be just, it wouldn't connect to us really. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the fact that we don't have control of our lives is what art is about in a weird mm -hmm. way in general. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so this, this is like the largest kind of, uh, kind of uh, range of that. I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, also I was thinking about the relationship of um, this talk to, uh, and, and uh, the heavens and the stars to language and how maybe uh, poetry fits with uh, um, astronomy in the sense that it's constantly thinking about what's beyond us, right. and but thinking about it from the vantage point of um, right. of the worldly, of the contained, of you know right, when you when right. you when you have to as a poet ground right. your poems in imagery, right. but then think about the unknown, the right. the unsayable, the yeah, sublime. Yeah, to kind of split it open, you know, crack it open. I mean, when I'm teaching my students, you need to crack this poem up, but it's like just too kind of uh, stayed, you know, it doesn't have that kind of terrifying thing. Uh, it doesn't ever, you know, it's like the po like the student poet is afraid, you know, mm -hmm. to, to let it in. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so I think the fact that this idea that, that we're in spa we, space, this is space, I mean, this yeah, is the yeah. universe right here, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that that's, uh, that's really helpful for, for someone to think about. Um, and I think poets try to bring that alive, to yeah. bring that into people's experience, make them aware of it, even though it's kind of frightening. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I can also remember talking to a student and saying that, you know, if I if we thought about this stuff all all the time, I'd be hiding under my I'd be right, hiding under right, here, right. <laughs> even though it wouldn't help. You know, but, yeah, but yeah. that's what I would I would have the yeah. illusion of safety yeah. here. Um, you can't think about this stuff all the time. You yeah. go crazy. Um, so, um, but 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 still, the, the 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 fact that it's really true, really there, is sort of is is is, is also kind of exhilarating. You know, to to to, to face up to. And po poems try to kind of do it nicely, you know, yeah. try to make you yeah. feel good, you know, yeah. <laughs> but also uh, scared, you know, a little bit of both. Right, to have to contend with that, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I wondered about your poem, um, uh, Rare Earth. Uh, yeah. Is that the, the, the two poem sequence? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where you, where you engage with the scientific and then you move to the historic. And yeah, you begin with this with a talk about the about the about the scientists, and then you talk right, about right. the Romans who are right, 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 who right, are right. you know looking at the sun and right. you know trying to bring the sun back, or they're not seeing the <laughs> sun; they, they have the fires it. to yeah, yeah, yeah. bring the sun back. Right. And I wondered, I wondered how poetry, and especially with something like astronomy, yeah. um, how poetry engages with both our kind of romantic desires right. uh, and the, and the sort of scientific reality that well, we I understand. Well, I like the, I like scientific language. I like how it um, kind of cuts through the, 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 the romanticized thing because that seems like kind of a, it's like kind of, co you know, it's, it's like a, a, some kind of thick clothing to protect yeah. you, you know, yeah. it's like you're wrapped up in something. Um, and I, I, I don't like that, I like the more stark. Uh, I like to face that. Um, the, the whole idea, the word abyss kind of has a romantic association, which I try, which I kind of re, I, I, I took that off of, I, I like took that off of that word. I, yeah. I removed that clothing and exposed it for what it was, which is, you know, stark arid, you know, terrifying kind of thing that we are alone, you know, this idea that we're alone um, um, amidst these enormous spaces that have no, that don't care about us, you know. Um, so, um, so that, that I, I think that's what I was in, interested in doing in that poem. And then the, the, the second part is the same kind of deal. Yeah. Um, this, you know, a kind of a laughing at them, you know, th th this idea that they could persuade the sun to do anything, you know, yeah. uh, the sun's not listening, you know, the sun doesn't care. Um, another poem I, I was going to read about, I saw in the paper two photographs of the sun, and one, it looked like normal with its, you know, sunspots and everything, <clears throat> and then the second photograph had no sunspots. It's just like, oh my God, what yeah. is this? This is really, you know, that this yeah. could happen. It's, I mean, I'm not a scientist, so it's like, 
shit, you know, yeah. uh, what is what is this thing? Uh, you know, what if it what if it stops? What if it goes away? You know, yeah, um, yeah. and the idea that the, the Earth's orbit has, has changed the angle of the sunlight into these mounds just slightly. It still goes in those holes. So it's amazing that it still goes in them after you know 5,500 years. But 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 you know. It's not going to always yeah, go in yeah. there, you know. It, it so the sense of change. the sense of the sun like turning away from us or going away, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's it. You know, yeah. we're gone. So I mean, so it really, you know, it starts just being about fear of death. You know, yeah. I think. Um, Do you think too that that um, compared to other <coughs> sciences yeah. and other scientists that 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 astronomers. Poets can relate to astronomers because they're studying this thing that is so great, so right. grand right. that they're trying to define. But but, it, but it's very clear. Precise. It's very clear that that we don't know. You yeah. know, that, that know. even scientists don't right. know what's out there. That's they have right. to they have to sort of acknowledge their right. their uh, inability to to Absolutely. reckon with it all as Absolutely. they're following. You Absolutely. know, in the scientific method. I can remember um, in college or graduate school. I can't remember where, where I was. Um, uh, people were talking about the you know humanities and science and how you know I, I think that there's this kind of assumption that scientists know everything, doctors know everything, you know they, they you know but they, they're arts, you know yeah. they're they're really they're they're so much closer. Than, yeah, I think that's definitely true. Yeah. But 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 on the other hand, the, the sort of cutting through the romantic, I love the precision of um, and instruments. I, I love their kind of discipline, yeah. and that really appeals to just my sensibility as a yeah. poet. Um, sort of not not letting the emotions, you know, carry the day in a weird way. You know, yeah. even though I'm trying to expose things to make people feel, but the way I do it is is very stark. And yeah. I think it's really, I think it's very connected. I think I spent, a, I was very ill when I was a teenager, and I think I've had a lot of, you know, I, I also started out as a biology major, so maybe yeah. <laughs> I don't know, maybe that doesn't do with it. But I really always had this respect for. Um, for that kind of uh, cold, that cold kind of language, the Latin yeah. diction, and trying to trying to use that to undermine or, or to work against, kind of to play against a more kind of emotional kind of language, and try to you know you always want to surprise the reader, you're always pulling the rug out from the reader one way or another, and you can do it by you know having one kind of language going for a while, and then bam, right. another kind, um, re redefining a word like this, you know, just right. exposing it for what it really is, right. things like that. One also makes me think about uh, the selection you read from the reef mm -hmm. and the way in which you oh, right, connected right, right, the right. inner and the outer. Right. That you looked at the that you know we, we went from the right. body, the right. inside the body, to right. to this hurricane that reached to the stars. Right, right, right. And the, the sense that it's moving, but it's you know you're mapping it on Earth, but actually you can't map anything. You know, it's yeah. like you, there's no, everything's moving. Uh, there's yeah. no way to map it. And so there's a sense of absolute loss of control, yeah. and then a kind of rage that comes out of that um, yeah. in a person. Yeah, it's huge, and yeah. it's huge stuff. Um, I love um, that, 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 that Bishop poem, where she yeah. does kind of the same thing. You know, she has this idea of the moon, and then her, the eye. Is, I yeah. haven't quite figured it all out, but there's definitely this inner, you know, outer thing going on there, too. Exactly. Well, going through the hole of the moon, yeah. I mean, that image was so, yeah. was oh, so evocative amazing. of yeah. exactly that's the sort of limits and the expanse that yeah. one, when one looks up, has to, right, has to engage right, with. Right. Yeah, like the end was sort of like the Romans, you know, see, right. seeing the moon is like, it's assuming it's a whole. Right, right. Assuming the sun can be persuaded. Right. Things, the other thing I wanted about and wanted to discuss was um, the way in which we see the gods in the heavens. And of course, you reckon with that mm -hmm. in, uh, in your poem about Mount Etna. And I wondered if you could just speak to why we do that. Why, you know, and it seems also well, so. Well, we think they're up there. And yeah, and we look here. at the stars and we make we right. make the gods out of these constellations. Oh, right, right. You know, which is a, in and of itself a kind of you know right. a, 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 a supreme metaphor right. um, that I think connects to what poetry yeah. through metaphor and simile and figurative language right. tries to do. I don't really think about that very much. I have to yeah. say, I don't think about that very much. I have that Titan in there, but he's like under you know the idea yeah. that he's like causing all the earthquakes and everything because he's trying to get out of there. Um, yeah. Can't. Why? I don't know. I don't know why. I just don't really. I, I haven't thought about that very much. Yeah. I don't know um, what to say about that. Uh, so it's for you, odd. Um, maybe just because all the power seems to be up there. Right. You know, the sun. Right. The, you know, the first right. god, probably. Right. Um, um, just the idea that we're just. You know, is it going to rain? You know, is it not going to rain? You know, what I mean, yeah. that kind of like we're just sort of little kids waiting. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, now that now they're uh, now they're like uh, making clouds in uh, Alaska, I think, uh -huh. to, to slow down global warming. Uh, you know. So maybe we won't be so little. Maybe we're, we have, we're getting a little bit bigger. Yeah, we have we have just a little <laughs> bit of control. Have, I, don't much, I don't have much faith in that. No, but, but it's anyway. interesting. I mean, I think you can look at the look at the heavens and think of think of some sort of supreme con, supreme power and, and right. you know make that kind of meaning out of the stars. Right. Or you can also look at them and think of the great abyss and the unknowable, right? Um, which seems and more they're kind of related. Trend. I mean, I I, I I I remember hearing on the radio one time this is such a profound thing, and I'm sure it's not the first time it was said, but it hit me. 
Is it faith, you know, a faith, a, a faith, the faith that you have, if, if you're a religious person, the faith that you have has, it relies on lack of faith. I mean, it, its power comes from fear, you know, yeah. come from, from la lapses in faith. And one of the best writers for that, one of the best poets is Hopkins, and it's those late sonnets, the terrible sonnets where he's struggling with his, I mean, he was a monk. So he was, you know, he was, he yeah. was committed, a committed Christian. And, um, but, he, um, but he had these dark moments and he's like in the poems, it's like the, the words are struggling, you know, yeah. it's just incredible. Yeah. Uh, so I think that, I think that, I think they're, they're related, I mean, they can be related. I mean, scientists talk about that, about, you know, being scientists who have faith in God still recognize that they can, you know, there's still stuff to figure out. Right, um, right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I wonder if uh, any of you have any questions you'd, good, you'd like to ask uh, our poet about. Yes, Ellie. Okay. Rob referred to your mountain poems and epic poems. Yes, yes. And, and what was strange to my head was that there's a whole cluster. You could do a whole other program just on volcanoes. On volcanoes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 These sudden ends of Pompeii. Right, these right. These sudden ends of time must give us pause. Yes. Mm. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, oh yeah. Ann Carson was like, all she does is, Ann Carson's a wonderful poet, and she just, she paints volcanoes. That's all yeah. she does. She it's paints it's only volcanoes. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Such a profound metaphor. Oh yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to figure that poem out. It's a kind of a long poem, and I, I'm working on it. Yeah, I'm working yeah. on it right now. But anyway, um, yeah. No, and then you, it, it's hard not to, or, or useful, I think, to contrast that to, the void when one looks up, and the whole idea right. of breaking out that you that you talked about, the earth breaking right. open right, that right, you talked right, about right, in the last poem, poem yeah. in the 9/11 poem, and how that then relates to how we see, uh, uh, you know, we see the, the the void that that presumably uh, um, that fills, and it is a sort of metaphor itself or a symbol mm -hmm. itself for what we're doing right. when we try to write a poem, which is this very right. you know uh, right. intense, engaged right. uh, 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 use of language that sort of um, supposedly, in a kind of romantic sense, emerges, right. but then has to contend with all the silence around it, all right. the space around right, it. Right, right, oh, that's interesting, that's beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> you have to tell Matea. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's been, uh, Rob's married to a poet. I'm married to a poet, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, any other questions, any other ideas? Any scientists here? That, yeah, because I feel like very uh, uh, insecure about the science part. Because I, I don't, I don't, I, I, there are people, I think, I think Heather McHugh, some people really know a lot about physics and they get it in their poems. And when I walked in this room, I just panicked. You know? yeah. <laughs> I'm, so just, I'm kind of an elementary uh, school level physics person. But I'm curious if, if any of it was interesting or surprising. Scientifically, I don't think so. Probably not. Well, I think ultimately poems even when they're engaging with scientific language, um, are charged with a different kind of yeah, purpose. Absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We're using it. Yeah. You know, we're always trying to find ways to set up the reader. Yeah, <laughs> to indeed, <feel. laughs> indeed. And yet, you know, uh, um, in my job, I've, I've had the opportunity to sort of travel around uh, DC and I went out to NASA Goddard and they have astro, astrophysicists out there yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who have all sorts of great terminology for the word that they're using. Right. I forget they have this thing that's the lightest substance known to man, and I think it's called, it's not called a liquid cloud, but it's called something along those lines, yeah. and you, know, you hold it and you can't even feel it. And yeah. they use it, they, they, they put it on, um, they put it on, um, 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 what are they called? Uh, not spaceships, they put it on, um, uh, what are the things that oh, float satellite? around the world? Satellites. satellites. Yeah, yeah. They put it on satellites uh, <laughs> to collect the dust. Now. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, I can't think of you know the proper word. I'm talking metaphorically. I can't think of this, the, the actual term. They yeah. put it on uh, huh. uh, satellites uh, to collect the space dust uh, oh. to then bring down and, and uh, look at for organic materials. Oh, but wow, it was shocking wow. to see, or and wonderful to see that right. they they use such uh, great metaphoric language to describe right. this thing that had a that yeah. had real scientific value, but had real scientific value in a search for the unknown. Um, yeah, I went to the Fermi lab one time and I was amazed by, um, I, I, I had a friend and we were taking a little tour, and every like, I don't know, 10 steps, there was, another, there was like a little alcove, it was along this uh, uh, kind of quarter of offices, and then there was a little alcove with blackboards. Uh -huh. Blackboard, blackboard, and you know, all these equations. And I started realizing they're like they're not speaking English. <laughs> There's like a point where the English can only take them so far, and suddenly yeah. they've got to start uh, writing in their language. Yeah. yeah. 
Any guesses? Wondrous, yeah. It's like, yeah. 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 The planet swimming into view. I mean, that, that's that's maybe one of those. Maybe that's sort of like what. I mean, that that. I mean, it's like a thought swimming into view, but it's like this discovery and just an amazing, uh, uh, just amazement, just astonishment and amazement at what's up there, out there. Well, and that's an interesting example, and I think a key example of what poems can do, because it's using that verb, it's using that verb metaphorically, right. and it's connecting, Swimming. yeah, and it's connecting the, the celestial to the earthly. Right. But then if you think about it, it's comparing two worlds that we don't quite know, because right. it, uh, we don't really understand what lies, uh, you know, at the bottom of the ocean either. The oceans right. are these great vast things we live among right. and rely upon, right. but, um, but right. that we're sort of contending with in the same way. So I think it's that kind of, that kind of reckoning, not only that reckoning, but a kind of inclusion, right, of that language, that kind of play that happened in that line, the, the planet swim Swims into view. Into view right. and, and also the way in which it is swimming into view, the way in which it's defining a kind of seeing, right. you know, and poems can do that. They can kind of, right. you know, shift how we see things Right. Reimagine. It makes me think of just the physical body too, and how things swim. And you know, I mean, just we're water. We're made of water. Right. You know, right. there's it's kind true. of a sense of swimming. Uh, things sort of coming into view, but it does seem like they're. It doesn't seem like they're just you know snapping into view. They're, yes. They're moving gradually into view a little bit. Um, so they have to go through something like water. Yeah. I don't know. It's, a, it's, it's such a great image. It's it's hard to define why these things work. It's hard to explain why. But that's the thing that I remember. I mean, the Cortez thing is amazing too. The, that moment at the end, that's at the end. And they were in awe and they're looking at each other with wild surmise. You know, it's so yeah. beautiful. But what I always remember about that poem is a planet. That's, that's, what I, that's what sticks in my mind. Yeah. Um, God. Yeah, and I think what makes poetry powerful in a way that, that connects it to religion um, is that sense of having to engage with the things we don't know and, and offer right. a kind of instruction, but a kind of instruction that is open ended. Right. Um, right. And right. certainly there's nothing more open-ended than uh, what we see above us. Right, that's right, absolutely, for us. Yeah, it's like, where's the limit to that? Yeah, yeah. The last, last frontier, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth, okay, for your great you. reading. Thanks, Thanks for coming you. out. Okay. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.